Apocalypse Now is without doubt one of the greatest war films ever made. A chilling exploration of man's descent into madness and despair amidst the carnage and destruction of the Vietnam War. Featuring the finest actors of their generation, delivering some of the most intense performances of their careers. It's one of those movies that anyone remotely passionate about cinematic storytelling simply needs to experience at least once in their life. Which is just as well, really, because the making of this movie has gone down in Hollywood history as one of the biggest clusterfucks imaginable. The problems and disasters behind Apocalypse Now's torturous production have practically become the stuff of legend, even rivaling the nightmare that was the island of Dr. Moreau. But whereas one movie became a laughable piece of sci-fi horror trash, the other turned out to be one of the greatest films of the 20th century, and I think it's kind of interesting to compare pair the two. So grab your LSD and smoke grenades and let's dive right into another episode of Production Hell. Based on the Joseph Conrad novel Heart of Darkness about a journey up the Congo River in Africa to bring home a rogue British officer, the script for Apocalypse Now was written by John Milius who changed the African colonial setting into the Vietnam War. Milius would go on to write no less than 10 different versions of his script, totaling more than a thousand pages, and that's before the movie even started filming. Anyway, Milius wanted his mate George Lucas to direct it, and they even got a as far as location scouting in South Vietnam, but it turns out that shooting your movie in the middle of an active war zone is a tricky thing to get permission for, and George was already busy on another little project that he had in mind. So he dropped out, and Apocalypse Now was shelved. However, Francis Ford Coppola had been interested in the project for a while, and with Lucas out of the picture, he stepped in and decided to direct the movie himself. He knew he'd need access to American military equipment for the big battle scenes, so he approached the US Army about a cooperation deal. That is, until they read the script, and they were like, nah, it'll be fine. This forced him to shoot the movie in the Philippines, because they were pretty much the only ones with US choppers willing to help out. Unfortunately, the choice of location would cause its own problems further down the line. Casting also proved to be difficult. Coppola approached everyone from Steve McQueen to Al Pacino, Jack Nicholson and Clint Eastwood. Fuck man, my brain just about shut down trying to imagine this movie with Clint Eastwood as lead actor. Anyway, none of these guys were keen to spend months in the Filipino jungle, so eventually Coppola settled on Harvey Keitel for main character Willard. Marlon Brando was convinced to play the antagonist Colonel Kurtz for a hefty paycheck, and Robert Duval and Dennis Hopper were soon signed on as well, which was a pretty decent cast for the mid-1970s. Everything seemed to be going well as the production moved to the Philippines in the spring of 1976 to begin their shoots. It didn't last very long though. The problems began pretty much straight away. Coppola was unhappy with Keitel's portrayal of Willard, and after some disagreements, Keitel quit the project and tore up his seven-year contract with the studio. Wait a second, a troubled production in a tropical location starring Marlon Brando that loses its lead actor before it's even got going? What does this remind me of? It is the most outrageous spectacle I have ever witnessed. Look at yourself! Anyway, with Keitel out, Martin Sheen was flown in to replace him. But no sooner had he started work than a typhoon destroyed most of the sets, costing millions of dollars to rebuild. Most of the cast and crew flew back to the States while this was going on, and some of them decided never to come back. Needless to say, things weren't looking good. The movie was barely off the ground, and they were already six weeks behind schedule and millions of dollars over budget. Things didn't get much better once shooting restarted. Marlon Brando finally showed up, massively overweight and totally unprepared. He hadn't bothered to read Heart of Darkness, or even the script for his own fucking movie. As a result, his scenes had to be shot in darkness and close up to try to hide his size. And since he refused to learn his lines, the only option was to turn the camera on him and just let him talk, hoping that some of it would eventually be usable. Coppola was basically rewriting the entire movie day by day, trying to compensate for various disasters and setbacks as they hit. 
filming the battle scenes proved to be equally difficult because there was a real life civil war going on in the Philippines at the time and the attack choppers kept getting called away to blow up actual targets. Cast, crew and equipment struggled in the sweltering tropical heat. Disease, drug and alcohol abuse were rife and security guards even had to be employed after the production's entire weekly salary mysteriously disappeared. I wonder what they could have possibly spent it on. When Dennis Hopper was having a tough time finding the energy to play his role, Coppola asked him what he needed to get into character. His reply was simple, about an ounce of cocaine ought to do the trick, Francis. The drugs were duly provided and Hopper delivered most of his scenes high as a kite. <laughs> what a legend! Not everyone was as impressed as me though. Marlon Brando was disgusted with Hopper's unprofessional behaviour. <laughs> That's a bit fucking rich, mate. And constantly berated him, so naturally Hopper made a point of provoking him at every opportunity. Eventually, Brando straight up refused to be on screen with him, which meant their scenes had to be filmed separately and spliced together in editing. The relationship between Brando and Coppola also started to break down as production dragged on, to the point where Coppola had to turn directing duties over to his assistant whenever Brando happened to be on set. Someone on the production team also got the bright idea to use real dead bodies from a local morgue for the outdoor temple scenes. I guess nobody really thought to question where they came from because they had other things to do. Until the police showed up one day and confiscated everyone's passports, not to mention the cadavers. It turns out that their supplier was a local grave robber and the production was implicated in his crimes. <laughs> you just cannot make this stuff up. You know, I'm trying to picture shit like this going down on a big budget movie today. Somehow, I don't think Disney would sanction behaviour like this. Things weren't going much better for Martin Sheen, who was already struggling with alcohol addiction and went on a self-destructive spiral as the weeks dragged on. Sometimes he would barely even function on set and had to be replaced with a body double for longer shots. The opening scene where he breaks down in a hotel room, cries his eyes out and punches a mirror wasn't acting. He'd pretty much lost his mind at that point and suffered a complete nervous breakdown. Shooting finally wrapped in late 1976, but when Coppola flew back to the States to review the rough cut of the movie, two things quickly became apparent. They'd wasted huge amounts of time and money on stuff that would never make the final cut, and the movie still didn't have a proper ending. The only option was to fly everyone back to the Philippines the following year for extensive reshoots. <laughs> Unfortunately, the strain of the experience was taking its toll on Martin Sheen, who suffered a massive heart attack while he was out in the jungle and had to crawl for half a mile to get help. And because everyone was worried the movie would be shut down if the studio found out how serious his condition actually was, he kept it quiet and pretended he'd just suffered from heat exhaustion. The near death of his main actor, combined with the constant pressure of filming in tropical conditions, spiralling budget and crew mutinies was inevitably taking its toll on Coppola too. The man lost nearly a hundred pounds over the course of the shoot, suffered an epileptic seizure, a complete emotional breakdown and even threatened to end his own life on three separate occasions. Jesus, at what point do you just say enough is enough? Anyway, somehow he persevered, and the shoot that was expected to last for 60 days dragged on for 238. When he finally returned to the States to edit the hundreds of hours of footage they'd shot, he was literally a broken man, mentally, physically and financially. Apocalypse Now had pretty much taken everything out of him, but the movie was in the can. Now we just had to spend two years editing it into a finished cut. Jesus, if I have to spend more than two days editing a video, it makes me want to do a Dennis Hopper. <sighs> oh, that's some good shit, man! The film finally came out in 1979, three years after shooting began, and despite some mixed reactions from early screenings, it went on to achieve massive success and is still recognised today as one of the greatest movies ever made. Apocalypse Now is a complex, challenging, gruelling kind of film about an equally gruelling war. It's certainly not an easy watch, and by the end you feel almost as drained as the cast and crew must have felt. But damn, you know you've watched something pretty special.
Some people consider the ending a kind of disappointing and anticlimactic, and while it's clearly not the epic confrontation that was originally planned, I actually think it fits pretty well with the overall tone of the film. Willard brutally cutting down Kurtz in a frantic, confusing scene, intercut with drug-crazed animal slaughter, and finally returning to the real world, forever haunted by his experiences. There's no emotional release, no catharsis at prevailing against an evil enemy who deserved to be destroyed. There's only the horror of war. It's a pretty good metaphor for the long, draining, and ultimately fruitless conflict that was Vietnam. When he was interviewed about his experiences after the film released, Coppola summed up the problems pretty well. We had access to too much money, too much equipment, and little by little, we all went insane. It's a testament to the guy's professionalism and sheer bloody-minded determination that he was able to soldier on through every disaster that befell him and pull such an epic movie out of the festering mire of insanity that he'd been lumbered with. Whether all the problems and challenges ultimately resulted in a better movie, I don't think anyone will ever know. All I do know is that while I'm glad this movie eventually got made, I'm even more glad that I was never part of it. Anyway, that's all I've got for today. Go away now.